Hi everyone, welcome to episode 5 of Books with Jen. If you are listening to this on YouTube and you would prefer to download an audio file to take with you while you're out and about on your commute, walking your dog, etc, etc, then go to jen-campbell.com forward slash podcast where you can download an episode there. So I'm really, really excited about this episode of Books with Jen. I'm excited about all of them. I'm very biased, but this one I was so thrilled to make because if you guys have been watching my YouTube channel for a while, you will know that one of my favourite books of last year was Beyond the Pale by Emily Urquhart and Emily is Canadian, her daughter Sadie was born with albinism, Emily's a folklorist and she's written this book about albinism and folklore around the world and it's just so moving and wonderful and excellent and Emily came to the UK for a couple of days because her book has just come out in the UK. I love the book so much that I've actually put my name on the cover. I've got an author quote on the front. I adore it. Um, And Emily and I had been chatting online and I don't know, I feel like we're kindred spirits a little bit. So when she was over in London, we had a chat and we recorded some of the chat for you for this podcast. And then we went out for lunch and it was a lovely, lovely time. So the first guest I have on here is Emily and she's going to talk about her book. And I urge you all to go buy it because as I said, I absolutely love it. And the second half of the podcast is with Will from Vintage. A lot of you guys have been asking me and Will to get together and record a podcast together. Um, Will has a booktube channel. He used to have one of his own and now he works for Vintage Books. So you can find Vintage Books booktube channel. He also runs a podcast. So I thought it would be fun to go and sit down with him and chat with him about books that are coming out with Vintage in the not too distant future. So he can tell you about summer releases and all of that stuff. We're going to have a chat. So yes, grab a cup of tea, Get on with whatever you're doing, washing the dishes. That is what I'm doing when I'm listening to podcasts, mostly. I hope that you guys really enjoy this episode of the podcast. Let me know. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave me a comment after you've listened to it. If you're listening to this elsewhere, drop me a tweet or send me an email. I'd love to know your thoughts. And if you have requests for future episodes of Books with Jen, let me know. My email address is jenvcampbell at gmail.com. You can also find me at Twitter at Aeroplane Girl. I hope you guys enjoy this podcast and I'll speak to you very soon. Well, I'll speak to you past me. We'll speak to you in a second. But, you know, future me will speak to you soon as well. Lots of books, love. Hi, guys. I'm here with Emily Oka and she has written the book Beyond the Pale, which I have been talking about a lot which you've probably seen on my channel. And if you haven't, I don't know where you've been or you haven't been listening. But Emily is here. She's here from Canada, which is really exciting. So she's only here for a couple of days because your book's coming out in the UK now, isn't it? What mm-hmm. is the date, actual date of publication? I think it's today. Today? Oh, yeah. that's exciting. Mm-hmm. It's not today when you're listening to it. That means it's out now. Yep. <laughs> so that is excellent. So you have no excuse and you can go and track it down. So Emily, could you tell us a bit about your background before writing this book? What did you used to do? Or what do you still do? And um, yeah, do. well, I worked as a, a journalist for many years. Yeah. Um, and then I was sitting in my cubicle one day, my sort of soulless cubicle at a women's magazine, and I thought, I think I need something more. Yeah. <laughs> and so I applied to do a master's in folklore, mm-hmm. which was in another part of the country, like a three-hour flight from where I was living. And a strange part of the country, which is Newfoundland. It's actually the most wonderful part of the country, but okay. it's also like people don't move there mostly. They move away because there are no jobs in Newfoundland. Mm. Um, yeah, and my boss was shocked when I told her I was leaving. To research fairy tales. <laughs> See <much>. you later. <laughs> <laughs> they just uh, thought it was the most insane thing they'd ever heard. Uh, Do and, they still think it's the most insane thing they've ever Well, heard? you know, I never went back, so <laughs> who knows. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was real, and I thought I would stay there for two years and then I got there and I immersed myself in folklore and it was like I had found what I had wanted to be learning about and reading about and thinking about my whole life Mm -hmm. and so I just stayed and I went on did PhD and uh, I still um freelanced the whole time but now I'm trying to work folklore into as much of my freelance writing as possible (laughs) which is you know pitching editors with that is can be kind of a challenge you can kind of see why me and Emily are friends trying to slip folklore into (laughs) everything that we're talking about exactly (laughs) what are some of the weirdest fairy tales or folklore tales that you have discovered during your research that you really hadn't heard of much before or a twist on a tale you thought you knew and you were like whoa okay I missed this bit Um, I think some of the most intriguing uh, bits of folklore that I came across as a student that I never would have thought of were um, contemporary legends folklorists rather than calling them urban legends as most people know them they call them contemporary legends because they don't always take place in the city Um, about fast food 
<laughs> about fast food. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You've probably have you heard like Kentucky Fried Rat, or there's always you'll see them there. They happen online now, but they used to be word of mouth, and there's always these sort of strange stories about um, weird things slipping into fast food. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I've heard of sperm mayonnaise and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, a lot exactly. Of that stuff. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and. Um, a lot of folklorists have traced that to sort of the rise in fast food culture and people having a fear of food made by strangers and, um, you know, no longer start like putting to your meals together in your home kitchen and that, yeah. that has created this fear and when we fear something we tell stories about them. And so that's just like one example but sort of in the early days I thought, oh, like I've heard these stories yeah. but I didn't know that they were they were linked to like a greater cultural shift in, in thought. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't don't think of that, do we? I mean, we think of fairy tales as bygone things and things that mm-hmm. we don't really do anymore. But yeah, absolutely, with celebrity culture and stuff as well. Um, what's your favorite old school fairy tale? Oh, that's hard. I know. Oh my Sorry. goodness. <laughs> I uh, I used to have. Well, I actually, I still own it, but my parents had this Grimm's uh, book of fairy tales a big large Mm. silver book I remember it so well and I used to take it from their shelf and lie under the piano I'm not really sure why and read it (laughs) oh which one is my favorite I don't know that's a hard question it is a hard question um the one I'm most familiar with right now just from from researching it for my book was the maiden without hands where um the there's a uh a man who owns a mill and he's quite poor and the devil comes to him and makes a pact and says you know if if you you have to sell me your mill with everything on it the land it's it's standing on and I'll give you you know all this gold and you'll be mm. rich forever and so he makes this pact and sells the land but he doesn't understand that his daughter's standing behind the mill and he sold his daughter but in this story he never um he never tries to fight for his daughter. <laughs> she has to fight for herself okay. to try to um, fend off the devil. And he keeps coming for her. And, she, and she's so pure. And she cries. And, and uh, you know, like, her tears cover her. And he's not able to get to her. But, the, you know, her hands weren't covered. And he got her hands. And it's just so gruesome. It's very Titus Andronicus, isn't it? Like, yeah. yeah. Like it's, it's very... And so... You know, in the end, she wins out, and she she marries a prince, and she grows these beautiful silver hands, and, you know, to hell with you, this horrible father who never stood up for her. And I just think it's so sad, because you think about that relationship between a parent and a child and the kind of trust that you have, and, and that's broken. And I, I think, you know, people probably told that story because mm. they maybe witnessed that or, or had that happen themselves, and they were trying to look for some kind of meaning in it. Like, mm. why would a parent hurt a child? Well... Maybe the devil made him do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and we can definitely get onto that with your research mm-hmm. um, and everything. That's very, very relevant. Um, so the book that you have written, Beyond the Pale, is about your daughter, Sadie, who was born with albinism, and you wanted to, I guess, research her story, like the history of her story, genetic story. Um, how did you start writing that book? I don't even know where to start with this question. It's a very, very big question. When did you decide you wanted to do research into albinism? I guess it was it was probably when my daughter was about a year old that yeah. I started doing folklore research. Before that, I had all these little recipe cards. I have some in my purse right now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had them stashed all over my house Mm -hmm. when she was really really young newborn and we were sort of figuring out that there may be a genetic issue and um, I would just keep notes on these recipe cards about what was happening and what I was thinking about and how I was feeling and then I would bring them with me to doctor's appointments yeah because I could sort of distance myself and become a reporter again and draw on that background and you know if I was hearing news I didn't particularly want to hear it was fine I could just take notes yeah and then I could look at it after the privacy of my own home and and deal with it that way it's also difficult when you're going to a doctor's because I think often you just go in and you don't words are said to you and oh, they just no. they you need to write them down or have someone else with you otherwise it's just it doesn't work no it doesn't no. and i mean i don't have a background in science or in medicine and so a lot of times they're using words i haven't even heard of or yeah. concepts that i've never wrapped my head around before so it was really helpful and anyhow so the stack 
got bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger. And then I went back when my daughter was a year old yeah. to school to start writing my dissertation, which was on nothing related to this. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept, I had a library in the off, or an office in the library, and I kept sneaking out into the stacks and being like, I wonder if there are stories specifically about albinism, but yeah. also human differences, you know, generally in folklore. And uh, I kept finding interesting stories, and some were horrifying and some were beautiful, but they were all really interesting. Yeah. Can you give a breakdown to the people listening of what albinism is? Because I think there is a misconception with albinism that it just affects your skin and that's it. Um, but it doesn't. So could you explain to the people? <laughs> yes, yeah, and I had that misconception mm. too in the be beginning. So albinism is a, a lack of pigment in the hair, skin, and eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, it means that people with albinism have less protection against the sun and so can um, burn easily and develop skin cancer easier than, than people who have pigment. Mm. But uh, the one thing that I had no idea about was that everyone with albinism has low vision. Yeah. And it's usually uh, visual acuity somewhere around the legally blind mark. There's a spectrum, which uh, I also learned sort of later on in, in Sadie's life, that it, it can be lower and it can be slightly higher but but everyone with albinism has a uh, has low vision and they're not exactly sure how that relates to pigment no one has been able to give me a, a very sound answer or they've mm. given me an answer and then another expert has contradicted it okay. so I'm not going to go into that because I'll just get it wrong in some way but but uh, I can tell you for sure that everyone with albinism has low vision so when Sadie was um, you know sort of beginning the diagnosis process yeah. we were told to contact the Canadian National Institute for the Blind and I had no idea why I was yeah. like for what like for <laughs> anyhow I figured out why actually <laughs> yeah you would think that they would maybe explain that to you um yeah that would have been helpful <laughs> it is it's odd the, the stories I've spoken to of people who um <clears throat> Because if, if you guys are listening, you know that I have, uh, well, you might know that I have EEC syndromes, which is extradactly, extradermal dysplasia clefting syndrome. And there is some crossover between albinism and EEC. Um, I mean, Emily's book is fantastic anyway. Like, I didn't just like it because I identified. That's not why. Um, but after I'd read it, I'd emailed her going, oh, my God, like, here's my life story. Sorry. It was lovely. It was so nice. It was a wonderful connection. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Do you experience that as well with doctors and nurses when Sadie was born, kind of saying things, but not really, they didn't know and they're not sure and this is new for you motherhood and you're like I really don't know what's going on but I'd like to cuddle my daughter please. <laughs> yeah no nobody noticed that she had albinism no. but they did notice her white hair it yeah. was very strange she was born with a full head of white hair yeah and babies don't always have that much hair to begin with but also hers was white 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 like yeah. pure white and that's the first thing I heard like in the delivery room like oh we've got a blonde here and I'm thinking oh let's just get this over with but um yeah people came from across the hospital to yeah. go, come and see my beautiful baby which let me tell you was very very thrilling <laughs> very proud mom and I was just yeah I was you know I'm so pleased and and you know I assumed this was sort of indicative of her, of the great life she was going to lead and I still do feel that way yeah but um Nobody mentioned that she might have a like they know they didn't link it to a genetic issue. No, uh, except for a janitor. Uh, she and I want I don't know if maybe she may had had it in her family or something, but mm -hmm. she recognized it. But I dismissed her, which was a big learning moment for me. Mm -hmm. Actually, you should probably listen to the janitor because she knows more than the doctors. But mm. um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, people came to see her and yeah. they thought she was beautiful but nobody understood that it was a genetic condition that element of being like oh my god this baby and I just imagine like a light shining from her <laughs> um, but that happens in some cultures doesn't it doesn't it with albinism that people think that they are descendants of angels yes, that, yeah 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 um there's a belief in among the Kuna people in Panama mm -hmm. that uh, people with albinism are, are special. They like, have revered uh, positions within society. It, there seems to be a, a higher rate of albinism there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, there's a Maori myth about, about the uh, people with albinism being descendants of angels, sort of yeah. god-like people. And you thought that maybe Noah too had albinism, perhaps. Yeah, that was, it's an interesting story because, um, so it was a British ophthalmologist in the 50s mm. who uh, read this sort of new version of uh, description of Noah's birth that 
came about in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he read it, and he would have had patience with albinism, and he probably would have had seen babies with albinism. Mm. And he thought that the description sounded very much like a child born with albinism. Mm. Just the hair was white as wool, and the eyes were, you know, unusual and illuminated the room, which isn't exactly what happens. But, you know, <laughs> the eyes do look a little different. Yeah. Well, I felt that way, but yeah. And so he, he felt there was a connection there. But, uh, so he wrote about it for, I think it was the British Journal of Ophthalmology, maybe, or the British Medical Journal. But then by the end of the article, he's sort of tongue-in-cheek about it, and he's, he's sort of suggesting that maybe it's a bit of a joke, because he's sort of considering the recessive genetics of angels and how that might have come about. And I, You know, I just... <laughs> so by the We're end, pulling faces, you can't see. <laughs> yeah, right, I know. But, like, oh, what? But the problem is that or not the problem, it's, it doesn't matter, but um, nobody seems to have caught on to I feel like nobody read the end of the journal article because yeah. I've read like genetic textbooks that mention that Noah was the first description mm -hmm. of a child born with albinism. Yeah. I, like, I come across it all the time and it, in a very serious way. Yeah. And I tried to interview him, but he was dead. So. Oh, okay, well, that's fair enough. <laughs> that he has a good out. excuse, that's all right. <laughs> but yeah, no, that is, you can't write about that and be in thinking that people are using this folklore as, as some kind of like explanation and then go oh but the explanation doesn't work because angels and genetics that's not a thing like, yeah, exactly. that, that, you can't do that. <laughs> okay all right i don't i actually don't think that a journal would publish that now no um when was that published the 50s oh fair oh well not fair enough but yes okay more yeah. understandable I mean, maybe I they see. would i'm not sure but i think what i think not mm. having actually spoken to this man i think he did see a connection and mm. i think he did wonder about it but knew that there's nothing as a medical person that he could really do. Like he yeah. can't like use science to pull together this theory. So he has to let everyone know that it's, it's just a thought. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So how? So where did you start with your research of albinism? And was it what was your aim when you went into it, or did you not really think about that? You just did. Oh, that's a good question. Um, in terms of research in general. Mm. Um, that was sort of very organic because, of course, I want to know as much yeah, as I, I can find out about, like, how you get this condition and, like, what it looks like, what the future will look like. Mm -hmm. um, so so I did a lot of, like, re reading medical journals and, and reaching out to um, top medical professionals. And there really aren't any specific experts in the field, mm. but... It was nice to have a sort of, a, again, a journalistic background where I'd yeah. be like, hello, I'd like to interview you, but yeah. really I'm also a mom and I just want access to the most information possible. Did you go in there as I'm a journalist or did you go in there as I'm a journalist who also has a daughter with albinism I want to talk to you? Oh, I did both. You did yeah. both, yeah. The combination was really helpful, yeah, actually, absolutely. because I think there are some people that probably wouldn't have spoken to me, but they yeah. knew that I had this connection, mm -hmm. so, they, oh, she's a mom, okay. <laughs> yeah, and then the folklore, that also in a way was sort of organic because you know when you're in the middle of of studying something you're so immersed in it mm -hmm. that that's kind of how you're viewing the world anyhow yeah <laughs> and so I was like well how does the, you know how does the world view this and um yeah it, it was all it seemed um all very organic so I was living it as well as writing about it um yeah. even the folklore aspect of it <laughs> so what were some of the first things that you discovered when you were researching um, some of the first things I discovered. Well, when I typed albinism into a Google search engine. Never do that. I, know, I never do that with anything. <laughs> I know. I, but I did. And um, the news stories were all brutal, horrific stories coming From Tanzania. out of Tanzania. Yeah. And um, I always feel bad when I start describing this because it's so awful, but everyone should know about it. Yeah. So, um there are quack, which doctors, not all uh, traditional healers do practice this, but uh, who make potions mm -hmm. out of the people with albinism who live in Tanzania, um, they, out of their body parts, out of their hair. And this has created a really gruesome black market where poachers go after, in particular, women and children, because mm -hmm. they're vulnerable, uh, who have albinism, and kidnap them, murder, or, or dismember and leave for dead and then sell these body parts to the witch doctors who in turn sell them to a, a huge cost to people who can afford it. So presumably the people who are quite powerful within yeah. society. And 
that was obviously very disturbing. That's one of the most disturbing things I'd ever heard. And then, I, you know, I couldn't get out of my mind. Like, when I would read these stories and you hear, you know, the mother tried to, like, grab the child and the child was snatched. I just, like, I felt like a connection. Yeah. Because I could, you know, I think we all feel a connection when you hear that kind of horrible human yeah. story or, like, a human rights crime. But I just couldn't get it out of my mind. Like, God, if I lived there and had my daughter there... I would have to worry not just about like sunscreen and about you know visual yeah. acuity I would have to worry about her, her safety her life like it just it blew my mind and, and they're all and the beliefs about albinism are pretty ingrained that people with albinism are ghosts they never die they're not real people they're they call stigma them zeros, don't yes they? yeah zeros, zeros. Yeah. or um oh now I forget the word it's like white person they called us that too in Tanzania, but <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I can't remember what. Yeah, but there's also isn't there? It's just not. It's, it's not just selling of body parts and putting them into potions. There are many myths surrounding people with albinism. Isn't there? If um, if you have uh, HIV or AIDS and you rape a woman with albinism, the myth is that you're cured. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so there's you know, um, women and children, vulnerable population, but like women and especially young girls, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. So that's, it was uh, really horrific coming across this. And then um, with my background in folklore, you sort of think, you try to approach cultural beliefs in a way that, where you can be kind of objective and understand them. And of course, I was unable to do that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you understood these things, they come from stories and they're perpetual stories. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, where do these stories come from? And why are they still being told? And why is no one doing anything about this? Um, which I think is why your book is very important, because I, 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 I think that the news is weird, because we know of these things that happen. I think a lot of people have heard of what happens in Tanzania, but it comes in a wave and then you forget it. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, why do we forget that? Why do we go on to the next horrific thing? I mean, I know that you can't deal with everything that's happening in the world all at once, um, but uh, it, it, they do get forgotten, these people. And I think that that's, that's, that's not, well, stating the obvious, that is not cool in the slightest. Um, so you decided you wanted to go to Tanzania, didn't yeah. you? <laughs> I love that response. <laughs> I will go there. <laughs> I, will, I found out about this place where it's extremely dangerous, yeah. and I'm going to go. <laughs> yeah, my family was thrilled. You yeah, can imagine. Well, because at first you wanted to take Sadie. With I you. did. Yeah. yeah, I was reading that part of the book where you were talking about <laughs> taking Sadie with you, and I was like, no, no. I know so many people have told me that. That's very funny. I really felt like, like you know, she, it's her story. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to bring her and have her be a part of it. Um, in some ways. I didn't know this at the time, but um, she, I don't know if she would have been in danger or not. She has albinism, but um, there's a man named Peter Ash who runs an advocacy program for mm. people with albinism. He's Canadian, um, so he's white, and he has albinism, and he has a hard time convincing people that in Tanzania that he has albinism. Okay. They just see him as a white guy. Yeah. And so you know, maybe she wouldn't even have been that recognizable yeah. as having this, this specific um, sort of ostracized <laughs> condition. But, um, yeah, I wanted to bring her with me. And then finally I realized we went to see a health nurse and the health nurse was, just looked at you. I was like, well, she was like, you, you can't get vaccinated for quite a few things when you're that young. Yeah. And so I said, well, does, what does that mean? Do what I just, would she just be open to, to getting these? like possibly getting these diseases or and that the answer was yes and I thought well I guess that's not very responsible yeah <laughs> um yeah and so really like even the flight alone like oh by hour 15 or something I was thinking yeah it's probably a good thing she's not with us yeah I mean that's not fun for her and probably not fun for you in the no because she was only two at the time yeah. so it would have been a challenge it, it would have been a bit of a and the sun it was incredible the kind of heat and the kind of yeah the sun would have been hard for her mm -hmm. so so in a place like Tanzania with albinism there's a whole host of you touched on it there of other things tied up with having albinism to do with race as well because I think the lack of identity or the lack of identity that people give to those with albinism because someone who is black who has albinism I mean I've, I've seen interviews and in your book too where they're saying look I am black mm -hmm. I don't look black but my family don't see me as black either. 
but the other people outside and white people don't see me as white. So I'm standing here shouting, saying I'm black, and no one believes me. And that must be really, really difficult. Uh, well, first of all, um, albinism is more prevalent mm -hmm. in Tanzania than elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, there aren't official numbers, so it's a little bit anecdotal, but um, it's about 1 in 20,000 worldwide people have albinism. In Tanzania, it's closer to 1 in 2,000, but I've heard mm -hmm. as low as 1 in 600. Wow. And so uh, after Sadie was born, the first time I saw another person with albinism was when I went to a conference mm -hmm. for albinism. So that kind of tells you how many people I had, you know, that in terms of uh, how often I might have seen someone. In Tanzania, the first day, I walked by three people. Yeah. And I felt terrible because I was like, I turned around and looked. And, you know, I'm you sure that, that person. I know. I'm sure that happens all, all the time. Yeah. But we don't speak the same language. So I couldn't be like, no, no, it's my daughter. It was just yeah. too complicated. Yeah. But I was excited. I mm -hmm. was like, man, this is amazing. Um, but, yes, there is there are some really negative beliefs about albinism. And um, we met with... Vicky Nittatema, mm -hmm. who is a journalist, or she was a journalist for the BBC, and Vicky is the reason any of us know about the atrocities and human rights crimes against people. She is the one shouting Palestine. about it. Yeah, she is the person who she went undercover, posed as a businesswoman, and met up with witch doctors and asked for these potions that are purportedly made well that are made from the body parts and and hair of people with albinism, mm -hmm. and sold to wealthy people. Um, to purportedly give them luck in life and love and business. And uh, she'd heard about this practice and she wanted to prove that it was true and then she wanted to tell the world and that's exactly what she did and she risked her life to do it. Uh, shortly after her articles went live, even before there were death threats, but after they went live she had to leave the country mm. for years because she just couldn't go back because her life was in danger. And uh, yeah, so we met with Vicky there, which was a real thrill for me. Mm. I think she's the bravest person that I've ever met, yeah. and that was really exciting. I love the smile on your face when you're talking about her. This is <laughs> yeah. massive smile. I love yeah. it. Yeah, it is. It's just amazing. You know, you meet people and you think you did this, and and you're still doing it. So now, um, her report got to a man in Vancouver named Peter Ash, who has albinism. He really wealthy, um, successful businessman. He heard this story and just thought these people are my brothers and my sisters. I'm doing something about this, yeah. and he founded an organization that is now in place to um, essentially create change. Mm -hmm. Both in um, there's an office in Canada and one in Tanzania, and Vicky heads up the one in Tanzania. So yeah, we met with Vicky. I say we. My husband was with me, mm -hmm. um, and then we also met with children who had been the victims of these human rights crimes and that was really emotional and uh, and really difficult one of them a little boy he had just been attacked five weeks before we met him he hadn't spoken since his attack he had uh, you know a gaping open shirt sleeve where his arm should have been mm -hmm. the kind of stuff these kids have suffered is beyond comprehension to me yeah but I felt it was important to go there and meet them and hear their stories. And at the same time, we also met an entire uh, football team. <laughs> I was going to say soccer, but soccer is a North American term, yeah, I think. Yeah, football here. Football, football here. Yes. Uh, and that football team has definitely been on the news here. I've seen Yes. Them. Yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. and they call themselves Albino United. Yeah. Most of them have albinism. They, they are um, in the professional league. We went to one of their practices and met with them, and they were amazing. And they are, you know, these guys are not victims. These guys are athletes, and they are fighting for change. And that's, you know, that's part of their mission. The other part is the game. Yeah. <laughs> it's just about the game. <laughs> so they have kind of a dual mission in in, uh, in their sports team. Yeah, and absolutely. And, like, to play football as well, out in the hot sun in mm -hmm. Tanzania, when you maybe can't see the ball very well, yeah. That, that's intense. That, I it's think incredible. That awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they, I mean, they, they do their practices at sort of dusk, so it's not high noon or yeah. anything. But but still, I, I don't know how, how they're able to see the ball, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think, I guess after a while, you're able to intuit. In terms and hear it. Of, yeah. 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 It's amazing. So you met Adam when you were in Tanzania, and you had met him previously yes. in Canada beforehand. And Adam's story relates back to the fairy tale that we were discussing before, The Maiden with No Hands. Um, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, well, The Maiden with, with No Hands is really about parental betrayal. Mm. Um, and Adam suffered the worst parental betrayal I've mm. ever encountered. 
his he, Adam has albinism. His father and his stepmother set up a situation where a poacher could come and attack Adam. Mm. His stepmother has been quoted in the press, which I can't say for sure if she really said this, but um, she has been quoted as saying, well, it was supposed to be attack without murder, so it's not so bad. Mm. They would get a cut of, of the money from whatever body part the poacher managed to saw off Adam. And um, they were in on this disgusting crime against their own son. Adam fought off the poacher, but he did lose part of his hand in the process. The mm. poacher tried to get his whole arm, um, and he, Adam fought and fought and fought. He actually bit him in the groin. But the man did manage to get part of his hand, and uh, through under the same sun, the, the um, Canadian organization that, that Peter Ash heads up, Adam was brought to Vancouver to have a hand reconstructive surgery. Mm -hmm. So he's able to hold a pen now. And, and I met him in Vancouver, and I was very nervous because mm. I thought he would really embody his trauma and I didn't really know how we would communicate. And then I met him and he was just this goofy kid <laughs> <laughs> who was sort of like, really, you want to record me? Okay, it's weird. Like, so can I just draw? Just, and well, like, this is just my story. Like, yeah, I mean, like, okay. Whatever, I've already <laughs> told this story. And, um, yeah, I mean, of course he suffered something totally traumatic and yeah. awful, but um, it didn't, you know, he is still like he's 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 moved Adam. past it. He's Adam. He's, he's Adam. the person he always was. Yeah. I think. I guess I didn't know him before, but uh, we went to see him at his new school in Tanzania, where he's safe. Mm. And we met his older brother, who is lovely. Um, he's about sixteen. Uh, he also has albinism. And then we met with two other children who we hadn't expected to meet. And one was Magulu, this lovely little boy who was wasn't able to make eye contact or or look at us or, or speak. And I asked the person who had brought us there about Magulu, and he said, well, he hasn't spoken since his attack about five weeks ago. Mm. Um, so he was still embodying his trauma. Yeah. And Emily and I were talking about this earlier. It's, it's difficult because you want to listen to people's stories, but sometimes they don't want to tell them, or they're not ready to tell them, or one day they might want to talk about it, and one day they don't, and you have to let them lead and just help them whatever way they would like you to which I think is extremely important um, and I wanted to ask you about writing this book and looking at other people's stories and folklore around the world as well as your own story and Sadie's story which um, you were writing about was that very strange because that's obviously quite even though you're going out and talking to all these people quite an introvert experience where you're collecting and you're you know gathering and writing down and then you put the book out into the world and then other people see it um, what kind of response have you had from that? Uh, the response has been really fairly positive, which yeah. is wonderful. You know, as an uh, just as an author, of course, that's what yeah. you want. <laughs> but um, please like me. <laughs> but with a personal subject matter, it is a little scary because yeah. people can certainly pass judgment, um, and it's the worst when people pass judgment on your parenting skills. Uh, yes, yeah, that, that I can I can imagine. Yes, <laughs> but um, I always felt that that writing this book and the research of this book really. Um, and then just our life in general with Sadie and, and learning about genetics has connected us to the world in ways that I didn't feel as connected before. And I didn't think that could grow any mm -hmm. larger. Yeah. But after the book's been out into the world, it, I feel even more connected. And I have had these amazing conversations with people all over the world. It's, I, I how many even, emails have you received? I know that I sent you one being like, here is my story. So, like, know, how many be, have you received? So many. I don't even know. Yeah. A lot. A lot. <laughs> yeah. And um, a lot of times there are people who have children with albinism or maybe children with some other kind of genetic condition and um, or people living with different genetic conditions or just people who connected to the story who have no like no yeah. children and no, con no connection to <laughs> genetics. And it's been amazing. And, yeah. and I feel like our whole sort of network and our world has grown since the book has been out in the world. Uh, it's been great. And then also, well, you would know this as an author, that your book comes out and your publicist is like, great, now you have to write like eight free articles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're not going to pay for it, but you have to write all these articles. They all have to be different and they can't be the same material that's in your book. Exactly. <laughs> so I did a lot of that and that's hard as a freelancer, but as a parent and as someone who wants to get the word out, it's been amazing because then they're out there in the world. And so... I think of myself and searching the internet for albinism and like 
you know, as a parent, what that looks like and what is that. And now people are finding what I've written. And I love that. Yeah, because yeah. you, you searched albinism and the first thing you found was Tanzania. Yeah. yeah. And if people are searching albinism, maybe they'll, maybe come they'll across, find you. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, yeah, that's happened to me and people have written me and it's really, I think that's great. And, you know, my, my experience isn't going to be exactly the same as theirs, but it can also at least give them an idea and um, and I, I feel very positive about it too so actually I got a comment on my Facebook page I think yeah. where one woman she said your article about I wrote like five things I wish I'd known yeah. for parents.com or something she said it was the first thing I read after my daughter was born that actually made me feel good Oh. And I just thought, great, okay, my job's good. done. <laughs> that is good, because especially at that stage where that's a vulnerable stage. Oh, it's so vulnerable. It's yeah. so vulnerable. And, and, and I've talked to a lot of parents in that stage, mm. in that, uh, that headspace, since um, beginning to publish on this topic, too. Mm. And I'm always open to that. You know, as soon as I get that message, I'm going to respond. And yeah. I'm going to be there for that person and give them whatever resources they need. What are you writing now? Well... The only connection between what I'm writing now and what I wrote before is folklore. <laughs> that's quite a big connection, though. I think that's all right. <laughs> I'm using folklore to look at, um, well, I'm looking at the stories and legends and beliefs and rumors and fairy tales associated with uh, nuclear energy. Oh, wow. Okay. And it's the reason I'm looking at this is there's a family legend mm. uh, about a house that my uncle lived in that was discovered to be so contaminated with radiation that the government bought it from him. They destroyed it, they dug a hole underneath it and they carted it off as nuclear waste. He lived in a town that had a power plant in it and the rest of the story goes that there was a mad scientist who lived there in the 40s who stole <laughs> radium from his workplace and then conducted experiments. Wow. <laughs> so what I'm doing now is I'm trying to find out what really happened okay and as I find out what really happened I'm also going through sort of the history of nuclear power and all the amazing folklore that has come out of this the past hundred years of, of our that sounds amazing clear story <laughs> I love that I think that sounds amazing you know when I was born the doctor said to my mum it's probably Chernobyl <gasps> the rains come over it's probably Chernobyl really <laughs> yeah Oh my yeah. goodness! Yeah. I've been there actually. To Chernobyl. You've been to Chernobyl? Yeah, I lived in Ukraine for a bit, so I visited Chernobyl. So that that'll be part of the story too. <laughs> Amazing! I I have not been. Um, I do have a um, a book called Dispatches from Dystopia, which looks at uninhabited places and oh, how eerie they are, which sounds quite fun. But I haven't read it yet. I can't but, believe the doctor said that. Well, he didn't say it when I was born, but he had later said it. And he was trying to like you know because my mom was like, well, why? Like why? And he should and have been. His and he should have been. He should have been. Wow, these things happen. Was he joking? Well, he was just that there are many reasons. You know, maybe you went next to an animal that you know, because you know you're not supposed to go next to some kind of farm animals when you're pregnant. Maybe you went next to an animal, or maybe it was <laughs> smoking. Even though my mum didn't smoke. Um, smoke, or maybe it's Chernobyl because you know the rains came over and it rained in the Lake District, and that's not far away because this is Newcastle. So maybe that. Like just, just it's the, that that element that doctors should never do of blame. Yeah. It's like, well, you're here and this happened, so that's probably why woman, it's probably woman with babies. Way it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That blame thing. Oh my God. There is, a, I think there's going to be so many stories to do with that, and obviously there already are to do with um, nuclear power. Did you hear about, I'm sure you did, in Japan um, after uh, Fukushima? Mm -hmm. um, there were, there's a band of people who were over 70 who said that they would go and that they would go into oh, the power right. plants and they would try and cool down the reactor because it would, the radiation was so high. And yeah. they said they didn't want young people going in because they would get cancer. And they said, it's okay because we're old, so we'll go. So this band oh, of old people that's to lovely. go in. Yeah. And it's true, radiation takes a long time, actually. Yeah, so they were like, to... well, we'll be okay because yeah. we'll be dead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they recruited a lot of people and they got a chef and they also got um, a singer because they needed entertainment. Oh, and no, they that's went, so lovely. No, I, I know. know parts. I was reading it and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, this is great. I'm going to have to include it in the book and I'll, I'll send you'll you, be in the acknowledgements. I'll send you, I'll send you some links. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to talk to you and your flying oh, visit. thank you. It was really it's, lovely to meet. It's, it's really so nice. nice we kind of meet, we've been <laughs> chatting over the internet and, and now this has happened. It's really, really nice. Yeah, it's so yeah. exciting. Thank you. Go buy Emily's book. It's great. Uh -huh. Yeah, go buy. I will link it in the description. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
You guys have been requesting that Will and I, Will from Vintage, who is sitting right next to me, get on a podcast together, so we're here. Hi, Will. Hello. Do you want to plug your own podcast? Because I feel like we should do that. Okay, let's totally do that. Okay, so uh, the Vintage Podcast, which yes. is available on SoundCloud and iTunes, of yes. course. Um, it's a monthly podcast, and Alex Clark and I sort of host it together, and we often have guests in the studio where we talk about stuff around a table. And then we have interviews with authors. We sometimes try to go out and about. Recently, we've been to the British Museum. We've been to a distillery. We've been to all sorts of places. So nice. uh, it's a great place to hear about lots of different types of books and in fact the most recent one uh, it was all about Greece so we spoke to Yanis Varoufakis we spoke mm. to Alex Andrea about food we went to the British Museum with Karen Alexander to talk about the ancient Greeks it, it all happened that is really exciting out and about I like that I yeah. like that we're not out and about right now we we're, sat s- we're sitting in the random house offices eyeing up some cake which we are about to eat in a minute we are yeah we, I would offer some up as a giveaway but I don't think it would reach you <laughs> guys so last. we're just gonna you know we're gonna eat it for you doing, <laughs> doing you a favour <laughs> so I wanted while I was here I wanted to get Will on to talk to you about some books that Vintage are bringing out in the not too distant future because you've got some cool ones I see you have a list here I'm I've got a list here yeah just to remind myself so I've, I've, read, I've read the girls you have the girls, read the girls I have I have I like this very hazy feeling 1960s drugs debauchery cults Cults. No, I enjoyed it. It's so hyped up, and you might think because it's so hyped up, it's quite commercial fiction. But it really it, it kind of straddles that mm-hmm. literary fiction, commercial fiction, all wrapped up together. I think that's in fair. a pretty dirty bow. Yeah, I yeah. think. I mean, she is one of those authors, Emma Klein, who is sort of the kind of author that makes you feel a little bit sick if you're. Older. I want to hate her because isn't she like twenty one? She's well, no, she's a bit older than that now. I think she's about twenty seven which oh, is still okay. very allowed. young to be writing a debut novel of that quality. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, I think the writing is fantastic, and there's some really big-hitting fans out there. Mark Haddon, Richard Ford, you know, they're all kind mm. of going, this is a serious writer. So yeah. not only is the book great, but I think she is somebody to really keep an eye out on, because I think she's... Do you know if she's writing a new one right now as well? No comment. Oh, <laughs> No, I'm sure she Secrets. is. I'm sure she is. <laughs> what else is on your list? What should we should be looking out for? Well, I suppose that would be big. That's sort of like our, you know, big debut fiction. But of course, we've got some some fiction from from other writers, and I'll mention a few which are going to be what I would put in your sort of prize winner category. You'll hear about mm-hmm. them on prize list. So, Anne N writes the Green Road, which is now in paperback, is uh, on the Bailey's prize list. I know. And I'm reading it at the moment. Well, yes, I just yeah. I've been a big advocate for that book because I absolutely love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you haven't already, I do urge you to do it. Um, great novel about family who've been sort of split apart by growing up and moving to different parts of the world all coming back together because the matriarch is looking to sell the family home and th- an amazing cast of characters really really funny novel but also painfully uh, emotional as it kind of goes through I just she's a master it's the last Christmas isn't it in their mother's house yeah, yeah. well there's yeah. a section in there where she just this one character describes going shopping doing the Christmas shopping it's so mental <laughs> that thing that we've all done where you go to the supermarket and you're just cramming your shopping trolley full of stuff and you still forget things like and the she turkey has, she has to go back she forgets <laughs> potatoes yeah. uh, and obviously you know she thinks about getting out of the car on the way home and just digging some out of a field in order to them. it's an amazing book um, The Gustav Sonata which is the new novel from Rose Tremaine which is coming up later oh, this year I haven't heard of that one. Well, see, Rose Tremaine, I think, is one of those writers who it's very easy to take her for granted. She writes these very well-polished novels which absolutely deliver. And so you just kind of get used to receiving them and kind of going, isn't that lovely? But Mm. I think it's every now and then you just have to kind of go, that's really hard what she's doing. And she's written this great novel which is about the friendship between two boys in Switzerland. And it goes across pretty much the whole of their lives. And it's a very quiet and subtle novel that actually does something really quite devastating towards the end it's just as I say the kind of thing that seems very easy on the page but you have to kind of respect the craft that's gone into it a good writer is like a good ballerina yes they make it look easy yeah but but really their feet are getting ripped apart yes yes it's a scene of (laughs) carnage down there it is Um, but that's amazing and then David Saloy who is uh, one of the Granter best young British novelists uh, he's got a novel out at the moment called All That Man Is just been published and again the quality of writing in that book is just insane it's one of those things as you're reading through it you just go oh Oh, you know, you just want to kind of give him a gold star, <laughs> which you can't do. You can put uh, them on the page. You can put though. them on the page and send him the copy to go. That's how many gold stars I gave you. Well done. Um, but that's great. So that, that's some really good fiction to look out for, and I think you'll hear about them on various prize lists as we go through the year. Mm. Um, non-fiction. Oh yes. I think people, please. you know, like people really got into something like H is for Hawk, which is that what we might call it's not sort of narrative non-fiction, but you know when you really get a lot from a non-fiction book. And the, we have a book coming up called Dadland by Keggy Carew and she basically her dad was part of the Jedburahs which was sort of like a secret 
part of the army. Mm. Um, they're like special services. And she basically found out more and more about what he was actually doing. He was known as Lawrence of Burma because that's where he was stationed. And they were doing things like blowing up bridges and sort of counterinsurgency and all that kind of stuff. And he was basically beginning to lose his memory because of uh, dementia. And it was a question of her grabbing these memories before they disappeared for good yeah. and doing loads of research. And when she actually found out more and more about her dad, it made a bit more sense of her whole childhood and life. He was a very, very unorthodox character, not a great sort of family man, because of course the stuff that he was doing was so extraordinary. And I think that that book could be really big. I think that people will really get behind that story. And also, I guess you run the risk of finding out awful secrets about your family when you start delving in like that. Absolutely. Did she find out stuff that she wished she hadn't? Uh, I don't know that she found out stuff... No, I think it was that thing of making far better sense. I think, you know, if you're with your family, sometimes it's quite hard to see them because they're so it's close. real people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you found out about them and, and sort of see this documentary evidence of things that they haven't spoken about, I think this happens a lot with people who've fought in the wars. Mm. They don't often talk about the details. And when you find out, you just go oh I see you know, yeah. and you have just such a wider understanding and I think probably a bit more respect mm. for ma what makes them a, a whole person yeah absolutely um, so there you go that's some, some non-fiction and then I'm going to mention another non-fiction yes, in fact I've brought you a, a proof oh, of it here thank you very much I think this is something that you will like so this is Flaneurs by Lauren Elton I love this cover it's a great cover and imagine it in your head guys I'll, I'll, google it We'll yes, Google it. It's got a sort of okay. lovely sort of Victorian sketch um, of, a, of a flaneur, a man, walking. But on it has been sort of scrawled a, a woman's dress because this is about women who walk. And it's, an, it's a collection of... She's an essayist, really. Mm. But it's a collection of thoughts and ideas about women walking. And it takes you around lots of different cities. And I think I'm going to call this sort of like the quiet... This is the sleeper. I think this is a book that could get passed from reader to reader and could become something really exciting because... I just think particularly female readers, obviously, but mm. I just think there's something about that idea. We, run, we read sometimes to travel, don't we? To kind yeah. of go to different places. And that's exactly what this book will do. It takes you to different parts of the world. And the whole idea of walking, perambulating, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, <laughs> is, is in there. And I think that if you like the kind of book that allows you to travel while sitting in your armchair, this book I do be. like that. I'm a very lazy person, so I do, <laughs> I do enjoy that <laughs> quite a lot. Um, so this is this is the book that people are going to be whispering about in the corner of bookshops, is it? I think so. And I think as well, you know, if you're the kind of reader who wants to kind of go, oh, do you know what you should read? You want to look really cool and sort of say you've discovered this book. Which because is it's about Paris and New York and Tokyo and Venice and London. I mean, come on. Yes. Fabulous. So that it's, it's all there, which I think I think that's I think that could be a little. So I can read this and feel clever. Can you I? can you take that and thank you very yeah, much. Take my take the cleverness. Thanks. Um, what else is there to mention? I think short stories, please. Oh, short stories. Okay, so Mark Haddon, who yes. we all know from things like Curious Incident, things like that, has written a debut story collection, and it's which is obviously quite far into his writing career. And he's spoken recently about why it was he'd finally unlocked the short story it's because he felt like he'd been reading ones that he was supposed to love and he didn't really love them they're all very well behaved and sort of quite quiet reflective and he wanted something with a bit more punch so he read a couple of stories one was by Wells Tower um, who you should also read if you haven't yeah. Wells Tower's uh, Everything Ravaged Everything Burned is an amazing collection um, and it changed his mind he thought a story can have action in it it can be like a little mini blockbuster you know? yeah so he's written this collection called the pier falls which has a title story which is he read it with the vintage showcase that we came to yeah, yeah. it's about this pier falling down it's and gruesome just, it's, yeah I mean, <laughs> it's very it's, gruesome it's so, people getting impaled and yeah. everything and stuff like that it's just it's filled with powerful language which is evocative and, and makes you kind of go Ugh, you know yeah. and it's filled with stories like that so i think that that's an interesting story collection because I think probably not what you might be expecting from somebody no. like Mark Haddon. And I'm wondering if I'm going to get on with that very well because what he said, like, you know, oh, I hate these short stories when nothing happens. <laughs> I love short stories when nothing happens, Mark Haddon. <laughs> I think there's room for both. I there is room for both. both. What other short stories can we expect? Um, is Fen coming out soon? Fen is coming out soon. So, yeah, a young female writer with a collection of stories which are very much of... It, from a place, uh, from the, yes. the, the Fenlands of, of Norfolk. And I think if you like those stories which have a transformative element to them, again, I gave you that collection of because I, I thought... I've got that, and Mercedes has read it, you know, she loved it. Well, I just think that, you know, if you like Angela Carter, if you like those kind of 
um, short stories where something magical can happen, mm. but it's not sort of outlandish. It's just the thing that literature can do where you absolutely believe that, for example, a woman could turn into an eel. You know, that it, I it just that. takes you there. And if you've ever been to Norfolk or Suffolk, you know, there is something about that landscape. If you've read Graham Swift, you will yeah. know it well. You know, it has that kind of. And it has its own folklore and stuff, and that's not talked about much. No, in, absolutely in books, not. Not at all. It's I love how you just did that a big name drop as well, like kaboom, Angela Carter. It's Boom. like silence. Who we also mm. publish. <laughs> <laughs> Very recent, yeah. <laughs> Hot on the shelves. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, um, so Fen is, when is Fen coming out? Uh, I think Fen is, oh, put me on the spot, what is that, June, I think? Maybe? Okay, so it is the summer. Yeah, I think it is, it's definitely coming up in the summer. And then a bit later in the year, there's some big hitters, which I think you know, is worth flagging up. We've got a new novel from Ian McEwan mm-hmm. called Nutshell. There is not much that can be said about that at the moment because there isn't. But I just think that any time McEwan writes a novel, people are going to be interested. Yeah. Um, I'll be really intrigued to read this one and to see where he's taking us next. And then Hermodeus is uh, the next book from Yuval Noah Harari, who wrote mm. Sapiens. Oh, yes, I and love Sapiens. This is kind of... So if Sapiens was about how we got to where we are today, yes. Amadeus is about where <gasps> we're going next. Well, that's exciting. Which is really exciting. And he exciting. has spoken to us a little bit. He did a, a speech at one of our conferences, and it was kind of terrifying because he was talking about uh, how we combine with technology, basically, to move okay. into the future. and how Is it going to actually be really depressing when we read this? I don't know about oh, depressing, shit. but there is something... They have, you see it a bit in films now. That, like, is it called Elysium, that film with Matt Damon? You know, the, the sort yeah. of the haves and the have-nots people who have access to technology people who don't we already have it now it's just assumed that you've got a, a laptop or a mobile phone yeah. with an email otherwise you can't do most of the things that people do nowadays shop online use social media record, yeah, po- record podcasts exactly yes. mm-hmm. so I think it's very interesting to remind ourselves that actually a lot of the earth's population do not have that stuff no. and will not have access to the kind of technology that might change our lives in the future so I'm going to widen the gaps in societies between people exactly absolutely yeah. that sounds amazing so is that out October? That, that will be yeah right towards Christmas the end of the year yes mm-hmm. yes so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that so yeah there we go I've taken you from from now until into the future (laughs) you did very well 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 done see where that takes us excellent work (laughs) you guys should definitely go and check out Will's podcast Will uh, what is your job title at Vintage I'm officially called a community manager excellent which makes it sound a bit like I have to look after strange people which I I, it's you not really do, what it is but you have to look after the books but I'm basically there online social media for vintage uh, there's a YouTube channel there there's is a YouTube, YouTube channel. channel there's a vlog which you must come and subscribe and watch and talk to me there or talk to me on Twitter mm-hmm. Facebook wherever it might be there's lots of things I would love to share with you because as, as you've heard lots of great books yeah. um, and finding the right readers for them is, is what I'm here to do go and subscribe and listen if you're listening to this on YouTube I will link below if not give it a quick Google you'll find Will he's all over the internet it's like a virus go, go find him get infected oh actually I'm going to stop this I'm going to stop this simile it's not very nice okay all right. Okay. thanks very much Will that is absolutely my pleasure <laughs> we're going to go eat some cake now yes sorry you're not here guys we love you very much speak to you later bye bye